This lecture is titled Vietnam and the New Left, and the focus question is how did the Vietnam War transform American politics and culture? The rise of a white youth student movement was a surprise to many. Colleges had long been conservative institutions that drew their students from the privileged strata in American society, and few thought college students in the 1960s had anything to complain about. But student definitions of freedom, as they took form in a critique of mainstream values and institutions, birthed a protest movement that came to be called the New Left. What made the New Left new was its rejection of the political and intellectual categories that had shaped radicalism and liberalism for most of the 20th century. It challenged mainstream America and the old left of the 1930s and 1940s. Unlike the Communist Party, it did not see the Soviet Union as a model society or view the working class as the main agent of social change. Not language of economic equality and social citizenship, but rather the language of loneliness, isolation, alienation, and powerlessness in a bureaucratic society whose affluence denied authenticity characterized new left expression. The baby boom produced a mass generation influenced by these ideas, as more than 7 million attended college by 1968. The new left ultimately had roots in the American Revolution and the critique made by the abolitionists of the gap between American values and realities. It was inspired by the cultural radicalisms of the 1910s and 1950s. But its most immediate inspiration was the Black Freedom Movement. The 60s, a decade of political, racial, and cultural turmoil, was born of claims made by those who felt excluded from society, from Southern and urban Blacks to middle-class students. Both the Black movement and the White New Left shared the belief that evils were deeply embedded in America's institutions and could only be resolved through direct confrontation. In 1962 and 1963, books appeared that challenged the 1950s consensus. James Baldwin's The Fire Next Time captured the anger of blacks. Rachel Carson's Silent Spring showed the environmental costs of economic growth. And Jane Jacobs' The Death and Life of Great American Cities criticized the urban renewal and highway construction that made cities larger and less diverse and thus less livable and socially interactive. But in some ways, the most influential critique came in 1962 from a small group of liberal and radical college students called the Students for a Democratic Society, or SDS. Their Port Huron statement, composed at Port Huron, Michigan, criticized American institutions, including political parties, corporations, unions, and the military-industrial complex. But the document inspired new student radicalism with its vision of social change. The authors of the Port Huron Statement called for the creation of a democracy of individual participation, where the, quote, individual shares in those social decisions determining the quality and direction of his life, end quote. Freedom for the new left meant participatory democracy. This rather vague standard was used to judge existing social arrangements, and workplaces, schools, and governments were found to be deeply flawed and undemocratic. The new left rejected a society run by experts, the dream of the progressive generation. SDS grew quickly to 8,000 members by the end of 1962. And in 1964, events at the University of California at Berkeley revealed the power of the student movement. This university, an immense and bureaucratic Cold War institution, imposed a new rule that banned political groups from using a central area of the campus to distribute ideas and literature. It sparked massive protests. Students, including conservatives, created a movement for free expression. Protest leaders likened the university to a knowledge factory and encouraged students to break the machines. Massive protests for months known as the free speech movement caused the university to rescind its ban on free expression. The Vietnam War transformed black and new left protests into a generational rebellion. The war, a logical extension of Cold War assumptions and policies, demonstrated the danger of treating the world in every local situation through a simple anti-communist lens. Few Americans, even policymakers deciding to go to war, knew much at all about Vietnam's history or culture. Cold War administrations viewed a complex national liberation struggle, led by homegrown communists who had broad popular support and Soviet backing, as a test of containment. The Truman and Eisenhower administrations had supported France's failed efforts to retain Vietnam as a colony 
but then cast their lot with the South Vietnamese government in violation of Geneva Accords that had promised elections to unify North and South Vietnam. By the 1960s, the United States supported No Dinh Diem's brutal and corrupt regime in the South. Fears that voters would not forgive them if they lost Vietnam made Kennedy and Johnson reluctant to remove U.S. aid and forces from Vietnam. Kennedy's advisors saw Vietnam as a test of whether the United States could successfully conduct counterinsurgencies, interventions against internal uprisings in non-communist countries, in order to stop Third World revolutions. But U.S. advisors in Vietnam aiding Diem's government could not check the progress of the communist-led Viet Cong insurgency. And in October 1963, after large Buddhist protests against Diem's regime, the United States approved a military coup that led to Diem's death. While Kennedy quietly questioned the wisdom of Vietnam, at the time of his assassination, 17,000 American military advisors were located in South Vietnam. Lyndon Johnson took office with little experience in foreign relations. While reluctant to send U.S. troops to South Vietnam and fearing interminable involvement, he felt that losing Vietnam would deliver electoral advantages to Republicans. In August 1964, North Vietnamese boats encountered an American ship on a spy mission off North Vietnam's coast. When the boats fired on the U.S. vessel, Johnson claimed the United States was a victim of aggression. Congress passed the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, authorizing the president to take measures to defend U.S. forces in Vietnam. Only two senators voted against the resolution, the nearest the United States came to declaring war in this conflict, and it passed without any discussion of U.S. goals or strategy. In the 1964 election campaign, Johnson said he did not intend to send U.S. troops to Vietnam. Advised to do so after the proper provocation, he launched airstrikes against North Vietnam and sent U.S. ground troops to the south when the Viet Cong, in early 1965, attacked a U.S. airbase. By 1968, more than half a million U.S. troops were at war in South Vietnam. U.S. forces bombed North and South Vietnam with more tonnage than was used by all sides in World War II. U.S. ground forces ruthlessly hunted the Viet Cong in what were known as search-and-destroy operations that left villages burned and many civilians killed. But the might of the U.S. military did not break the Viet Cong insurgency or its North Vietnamese support. Simultaneously, Johnson sent U.S. troops to the Dominican Republic, where military leaders tried to restore the rule of Juan Bosch, the left-wing but non-communist president who in 1963 had been removed from power by a military coup. Johnson dispatched troops to quell unrest and ensure that Bosch would not return. With rising casualties and the massive bombing of North and South Vietnam, the Cold War consensus began to disintegrate. By 1968, the war had sidetracked much of the great society and divided families, universities, and the Democratic Party. With both liberal and conservative political leaders committed to the war, young activists lost all confidence in the political system. Opposition to the war united all kinds of grievances and discontent with American society. With college students exempted from the draft, the fighting of the war fell to poor and working-class draftees. In 1967, even Martin Luther King Jr., a one-time ally of President Johnson, condemned the war for its violence and its diversion of resources from America. To the Students for a Democratic Society, or SDS, the war seemed to epitomize the antithesis of participatory democracy, since U.S. intervention had risen from secret commitments and decisions made by political elites with no real debate. SDS organized the first major anti-war demonstration, which occurred in Washington, D.C. in April 1965, and from there protests spread across the country. By 1967, young men were burning their draft cards and fleeing to Canada to avoid fighting what they believed to be an unjust war. In October 1967, as many as 100,000 anti-war protesters converged on the Pentagon. During the 1960s, Americans' definition of freedom grew to include cultural freedom. The war was a central cause of the generational rebellion called the counterculture. By the late 1960s, millions of young people rejected their elders' values and behavior. Their ranks included not just college students, but young workers, even though most unions strongly condemned anti-war protests and the counterculture. For the first time in American history, the repudiation of respectable norms in clothing, language, sexual behavior, and drug use became the foundations of a mass movement. Much of the counterculture, such as colorful clothes, rock music, 
and images of sexual freedom were easily turned into mass-marketed goods, even though ostensibly they represented a rejection of mass consumer culture. But self-indulgence and self-destruction were built into the counterculture. Countercultural icons like Timothy Leary urged young people to take hallucinogenic drugs like LSD and, quote, turn on, tune in, drop out, end quote. Yet the counterculture was more than just sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Personal liberation represented a rebellion against and release from bureaucratized education and work, repressive behavioral norms, and a militarized state that wreaked destruction on distant lands. It encouraged new forms of radical action. Underground newspapers pioneered a highly personal and political journalism. The Youth International Party, or Yippies, injected human spectacle into protests, in one instance throwing dollar bills from the visitor's gallery onto the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, halting trading as brokers scrambled to grab the money. The counterculture established havens in cities like New York and the East Village and San Francisco's Haight-Ashbury. 2,000 communes were established in rural areas throughout the nation. The Woodstock Music Festival in upstate New York in 1969 brought hundreds of thousands of young people together who were welcomed with the first song by Richie Havens, who began it by repeating a single word, freedom. Above all, the counterculture centered on the free individual, nowhere more so than in sexual freedom. The birth control pill had separated sex from reproduction and allowed free love to flourish. Religious conviction helped to inspire the civil rights movement, but a different religious development, the sweeping reforms initiated in Roman Catholic practice, such as religious mass delivered in local languages instead of Latin, led many priests, nuns, and lay Catholics to become involved in social movements. This created a growing split in churches between liberals and conservatives. Additionally, the quest for personal authenticity, a feature of the counterculture, led to a flowering of religious and spiritual creativity and experimentation in a variety of ways by members of various religious communities and denominations. For example, some Americans traveled to Tibet and India seeking spiritual guidance from gurus or religious teachers there. More sinister cults emerged during this connection of the counterculture with religious activity. These groups instead based their community norms on a single-minded devotion to a charismatic leader, often with tragic outcomes like that of Followers of the People's Temple founded by Jim Jones. In 1978, over 900 of his followers, women, men, and children, died in a mass suicide-slash-murder ordered by Jones. <laughs> 